Hey guys, Mr. Klein here with our second of two lessons on science and the environment. In our last lesson, we talked about the types of resources, renewable and non-renewable, specifically how it talks about uh, energy creation. And in this lesson, we're going to talk about how we take care of resources and how we can conserve them. So let's go ahead and let's get started. Fish! Hey, that that's one way to fish. I mean, just hold out your arm and you can catch them. Who needs a fishing pole? Uh, but fish and fishing and fisheries and things like that, are a really, really important topic of conversation with regards to conservation because it's a renewable resource, but the thing is, if we catch all the fish and don't let them replenish, we'll run out of fish. And things with that, forests and things of that nature, are really, really important. And we're going to look at this lesson, what we can do in order to be responsible citizens and do our part to help keep the environment safe. So let's go ahead and let's get started. All right. You might wonder why people call for renewable resources to be conserved and managed. I mean, you might think if they can be renewed, then they can last forever. Like I said, with these with the fish in the last screen, it's not true. For living organisms, it's important to have the amount of the resource taken be less than the rate of growth to ensure there can always be a supply. Okay, so that's really, really important. We need to take less than is being replenished. That way, the supply can stay around. The practice of ensuring that there always can be a supply of a natural resource is actually what we call sustainability. Okay, and that's a really big push is that these resources can't la can last forever, but if we're not careful, they won't. So we're going to look at some ways that we can use some sustainability with our natural resources. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's create our graphic organizer, conserving natural resources. This is where we're going to be talking about with this lesson. So first off, we're going to talk about forest. Okay, now we use wood in our everyday lives all the time. After all, the paper you do your schoolwork is made of trees, as is the wood in your pencil and the writing surface on your desk, okay? And the walls in your house, most likely, okay? So on and so forth. Where does this all come? Well, forests, okay? You don't go to the tree store and pick up, you know, wood pulp in order to make paper. We get it from forests, okay? In order for forests to be able to be providing for our needs for the future, Forests have to be logged and have to be managed correctly. And there's two methods for conserving forests that we're going to look at. It's the way the trees are cut down. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start forest. Okay, this is our first way we're going to look at our conserving natural resources. Okay, so clear cutting is the first way. Clear cutting involves cutting all the trees, hence the term clear of areas of a forest use. Now, this is the first way, this is the most common way of, of taking care of trees and forests. What happens is they take out a section and just cut all the trees down, everything, no matter the size, and they use them for, you know, for paper and pencils and, and furniture and things like that. Now, the benefit to clear cutting is actually pretty easy. Uh, it makes logging a whole lot easier because you just go in and you clear out, and then what you can do is you can farm the f trees so you can plant trees in right behind you and then they can grow back up and you clear it out again. The sound side to the strategy is that while waiting for new trees to grow, the soil is vulnerable to what we call erosion, which is the carrying away of soil by water and wind. And also, if you're not careful and you don't replant, clear cutting can cause a whole lot of erosion in the process what we call deforestation. So this is what clear cutting looks like, okay? They just go in, they cut off all the trees, and then they replant trees behind them, and then they grow up from there. And this is what clear cutting looks like. Uh, this, is in, uh, this is in Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken. And this is clear cutting, but the problem is they're not going back and planting trees. And as a result, you have uh, erosion and degradation in the environment, which isn't very good. Okay, the other type is kind of the opposite of clear cutting, and it's selective cutting. It involves the cutting down of only certain trees that meet the requirements of the company harvesting the trees, and you leave the rest alone. So the tree company, the, the forestry company might say, oh, well, we need trees to be, you know, so-and-so centimeters in diameter. All of those go. So the logging machines go in as they cut only those trees, and they leave the rest of them alone. Now, the benefit is that re erosion is prevented because you're still leaving trees over, and also the local habitat remains after the cutting, okay? So, in other words, all the little rabbits and deer and everything else in the ecosystem stays there with selective cutting. But there are downsides to that. 
Cutting certain trees means more acres of the forest have to be used to cut down trees because you're not going in and clearing out like clear cutting. And if you want to cut down 100 trees in clear cutting, you just cut down 100 trees. Selective cutting means you have to go find the 100 trees that meet your requirements and cut them down, which means more uh, forestry machines and stuff like that in, in the forest. Also, the machines have a hard time maneuvering around smaller trees, which you can also damage them. And so this is selective cutting right here. As you can see, they only pick out some of the trees in order to cut. This is what selective cutting actually looks like. Uh, as you can see, only certain trees were cut down, the rest were left over. And so this is uh, contrasting clear cutting and selective cutting with the images I have. Okay, so the regrowth, as you can see, uh, clear cutting cuts down everything, regrowth grows up after it. Okay, selective cutting, you cut down only certain ones and then the rest of them grow up to meet those requirements and they get cut later. So let's go ahead and let's add our graphic organizer, clear cutting and selective cutting to the types of forest. And let's talk about fisheries, okay? And fisheries are essentially talking about the harvesting of fish. Fish are a very important natural resource that can be harvested. Did you know that over half of the protein consumed by people worldwide actually comes from fish? Especially in Asia and in parts of Europe, fish is a very important part of their diet. Here in South Louisiana, it's an important part of our diet because lots of people love go fishing. And also, we talk about seafood that becomes really important too because of the shrimping and oyster industries and even crawfish for uh, things like that. Okay, now... It's important to conserve fish populations since so many people rely on it in their diet. Until recently, overfishing reduced fish populations in popular areas by over 70%. Okay, we kept on fishing in the same areas and catching the same fish, and all of a sudden the populations bottomed out. In order to help fish populations rebound, fishing limits have been introduced, and the deliberate farming of fish species through aquaculture is allowing for fisheries to rebound so in other words you could only catch now you can only catch so much tuna or something like that catfish around here are caught through this and the idea of fishing limits uh and limits for things also involves hunting and stuff for those of you who like hunting waterfowl deer other sorts of game okay uh, we use that in order to manage those populations also Okay, and fishing can actually be really dangerous, and this is from deadliest catch out in the North Pacific with them catching uh, snow crab and stuff like that. They can only go out and fish for crab and catch crab for only certain times of the year because they want to keep the population safe. Okay, so the ways we can conserve fisheries are through fishing limits and aquaculture. Okay, so it's just like trees, you know, in forestry, you can manage the populations that way. Okay, so how can you conserve uh, non-renewable resources? Well, because you can't replenish non-renewable resources, conserving them involves processes in which these uh, resources are either conserved or recovered. The easiest way to conserve natural resources is just to use less of them and don't be so wasteful. Okay, so here are some ways you and your family can conserve natural resources. Okay, first off, you can turn off the lights in a room as you leave. In fact, I'm recording this in a room that's dark. Because I don't really need the light because the computer is giving me enough light. And I don't need to light in order to talk, as many of you know. You might want to use more energy-efficient light bulbs like fluorescent or even LED bulbs, which we'll look at in a second. You might want to increase the insulation in your home, especially in the roof, uh, to reduce the need for air conditioning in the summer because it keeps hot air out, uh, or heating in the winter time, which keeps heat from escaping. Going on more than one errand at a time with your parents in order to save gasoline. So in order you get in the car, you got to go run to the grocery store, and then you go home. And like, oh, we forgot to rent videos at Redbox, and we got to go back and get it. Okay, you wrap it all up into a single trip in order to save the amount of gasoline, and also it's better for gas mileage uh, because the more short trips you take, uh, your car is less efficient. And finally. It's not possible at the school where I teach at because it's a very rural school. Riding a bike or public transportation if you live in a city is a wonderful way because the carbon dioxide and fuel used by a bus can get split up between the number of people on the bus instead of a single person in a car. So this is a comparison of light bulbs, okay? You can't really buy these incandescent light bulbs anymore. Uh, they don't burn for a long time, only about 750 hours. You know, you usually go through them. Uh, the, the compact fluorescent light bulbs are a little more expensive, but they last a whole lot longer. Look, 10,000 hours, over 10 times the time. 
Okay, same energy, and they use they use five times less energy, but they're just as bright. Okay, and plus they use a lot less electricity because what an incandescent bulb actually is is actually a piece of metal burning. Okay, and also it puts off a lot more heat. But what's coming online in the past couple of years even more is uh, LED or light emitting diodes. Okay, that's like the lights that you see at you know, stoplights and stuff. They save even more electricity. They use even less. They're just as bright, and then they have they have five times as much lifetime as a chloro uh, as a compact fluorescent bulb. Okay, and plus uh, CFLs or compact fluorescent bulbs will contain mercury, which if they break and stuff, which I've had happen to me in my house, uh, require a special process in order for them to be picked up. And you can't just throw them in the trash. You got to like drop them off in certain places. So that is something to keep in mind. So here are some simple conservation tips. Only use what's needed. Use energy efficient bulbs. Increase the insulation in your home if you can. And reduce your car usage. So finally, let's talk about recycling. And that's the major way we can take care of conserving uh, natural resources. is through recycling or the reclaiming of natural resources for reuse. Now we do recycle paper. And I know that we, the paper comes from wood and that's a renewable natural resource. But I wanted to mention that right here. Okay, paper is recycled in order to use, reduce the use of newly uh, cut trees. Okay, so what happens is the more we recycle, the less trees we have to cut down. But there are three major non-renewable renewable resources that are often recycled. Okay, and there's things even like oil and, and, and used motor oil and stuff like that that can be recycled stuff. So this is, these aren't the only things that can be recycled. First off, metals. They're recycled for industrial and consumer applications. The metals are melted. And then they're rolled in the sheets for use again. Plastics, which are sturdy materials made from petroleum, which we know uh, from our last lesson, what happens to them is you take your plastic bottles that get chopped and melted in recycling plants. They're then poured into pellets and remolded into new products. And we're going to look at all this in, in the next section. Finally, glass, which is made of silicon or, or sand, can also be melted and cast into new products at the recycling plant for reuse. So if you're like me, you have a recycling bin uh, for your stuff where they put everything into a single bin, okay? I've actually found in the last couple of years that I've actually used recycling is the amount of trash that actually goes into my trash can as opposed to my recycling bin is amazing. Whereas I recycle about 90% of the stuff I use and only 10% actually gets thrown away. So what happens after you put it in the bin and the recycling truck picks it up? Well, the truck unloads everything. You have people sort through it and throw out stuff that shouldn't be recycled. Okay. Uh, then it runs through a machine which removes the cardboard, which is then taken off for a, re a paper recycling plant. Then it takes out the paper. Okay. And then people go through it again and they drop it off. Okay. Uh, where metal and plastics go in. And then... What happens is the magnet can remove the steel cans, which then go off the recycling. And so what you're left are the plastics and the glass and the aluminum, okay? Uh, use an electrical current to kind of move the aluminum out of the way, which then gets sent off to an aluminum plant where it gets melted and recycled. Glass bottles are screened out, okay? They're broken by steel disc, and then their, their pieces go off to another plant, which then they get melted down. And then what you, you have left are plastics. And plastics are made by different types. And so they're separated out the different parts where they go and they get shredded and they get melted down. So we're able at recycling plants to take all the recyclable material, dump them in one pile, and then sort them out. Other cities and other places like having the glass, the paper, and the aluminum and all that stuff into separate things because they go to different plants. So let's go ahead and let's wrap up our graphic organizer where you can recycle metals, plastics, glass, and conserving natural resources, we can recycle paper, okay? So we conserve natural resources. We like doing that because we want to keep everything sustainable, okay? We can conserve forests through clear cutting and selective cutting or, and even recycling paper. Fisheries and other animals can be, uh, can be made sustainable through fishing limits or through aquaculture, the farming of them. Simple things you can do is you can only use the resources that are needed, uh, use energy efficient bulbs in your house, increase the insulation, reduce car usage, things like that, and make sure you recycle, recycle metals, plastics, glass, and paper. So there you go. That's our lesson, uh, and that's it for the chapter. Hope you enjoyed it. If, as always, you have any questions, please let me know, and thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.